The birds are chirping. It is a warm early summer day, and only the isolated sound of shuffling footsteps on the gravel floor disturbs the silence. A peaceful place. Evergreen ivy has been growing undisturbed for years. The red candle set in an iron lantern has not been lit for a long time. Pink artificial flowers, badly worn by wind and weather, adorn an equally massive vase. On the tombstone are the names of a married couple who, after several years together, died one after the other for unknown reasons. And another name is also included. The name of a girl, their granddaughter, who was only 17 years old. Martina Posch died in 1986 as a result of a violent crime. The perpetrator is still unknown to this day. Let's get into it. It is the year 1986 and Martina Posch was 17 years old. She was by all accounts a popular, open, laid-back, yet ambitious young girl who very much looked forward to her future. Martina had been doing a three-year apprenticeship as an office administrator and in 1986 she had successfully completed the first year. But her future career was not the only reason she was so excited to kick off her soon-to-be adult life. The other reason was a romantic one. Martina had had a boyfriend named Habat, and the two were head over heels in love with each other. 19-year-old Habat had big plans of his own. While Martina was working hard to make a life for herself, he too had begun an apprenticeship, namely as a master locksmith. The goal was for them both to finish their apprenticeships and then get married as soon as possible. At this time, Martina still lived in her mother's house in Vöcklabruck, which is located in the western part of Upper Austria, and she got along very well with her mother. The only thing her mother would ever complain about is that Martina struggled to get up in the morning, and she had to practically drag her daughter out of bed. A bit about Vöcklabruck. Vöcklabruck's name derives from the river Vöckla, which runs through the town whose name in turn originates from a person's name, Vechela, and Ache, meaning flowing water or river. As of 2018, Vöcklabruck had a population of 12,300 citizens, and one famous person to have lived there is Emily Meditz Pelikan, an Austrian landscape painter. So Martina was working as an office clerk at a construction company in Atnang Puchheim, a town some five kilometers away from her home. To get there, she usually took a bus, which left at 6.42 a.m. sharp from a nearby parallel street. On November the 12th, 1986, a Wednesday, it was just another regular working day for Martina. She again struggled to get up, her mother had come into her room several times to wake her. But she managed and had a quick hot chocolate, ate some eggs, and left her home eventually at 6.40 a.m., just in time to hop on her bus. The day went by just like any other for Martina's family and friends. That is until the clock struck 5 p.m. and Martina did not show up to meet her boyfriend. They had previously agreed to meet up at his place and just chill for the evening. But she never showed, nor did she text or call anyone. Understandably, Habad was worried pretty much right away, seeing as this had never happened before and the two met up all the time. So around 6 p.m., he called up Martina's mother to ask if perhaps she just went home instead. Maybe she was tired or wasn't feeling well, but she hadn't. Her mother actually thought that her daughter was at his place. When her mother realized that her daughter was in fact nowhere to be found, she called her place of work to check if they knew something. Perhaps she had mentioned where she was headed after work, but shockingly, Martina, as it turns out, had not been to work that day. Staff then checked Martina's desk and they looked at her desk calendar. When they had a closer look at her November the 12th entry, they realized she had scribbled down the word vacation. This seemed especially strange because officially, Martina had not had the day off. Her company knew nothing about this. At this point, it should be mentioned that it was either never checked or disclosed whether this handwriting was compared to Martina's, or whether somebody could have added it later on. When her mother hung up the phone, she, 
together with Herbert, immediately went to the local police station. But as is usual, they said that Martina is 17 years old and that it wouldn't be entirely unusual for a teenager to stay out for a few days. But her mother said over and over again that Martina was not that kind of person. She would have never just taken off and made her mother worry for days on end. Martina also did not have any apparent reason to take off. She was doing well at work, at school, in her relationship, and adored her mother. Eventually, police agreed to help her mother and Herbert in their search for Martina, which the two had actually begun that very evening. However, at this point, authorities still assumed that Martina was either a runaway or had been kidnapped, so their search was shaky at best and led them in the wrong direction. This, in turn, bought the perpetrator enough time to move the body, which they would later find out. Overall, police searched local forests, hung up flyers, and questioned 2,000 people in what is one of Austria's largest investigations to this day. Some of those people were actually Martina's friends, who would be on that same bus that she took daily. When police spoke to them, they said that on the morning of November the 12th, Martina had in fact not been on that bus, which meant that somewhere between 6.40 and 6.42 a.m., she had somehow vanished into thin air. Her friends also told police that her not being on the bus wasn't all that unusual. Martina would very often skip her bus ride to work, and instead, she would hitch a ride with an unknown man. And she had been doing so since September 1985. A few months prior to her disappearance, Martina had shared the name of this mystery man with one of her friends. But despite doing so, it remained obvious that she wanted this very much to be kept a secret. She never said who this man was, how they met, or what the nature of their relationship was. Her friend, unfortunately, had forgotten the name of that person by the time she was questioned. Police would then search for her all over town for 10 days without success. On November the 22nd, two hobby divers were diving in Lake Monze, which is around 40 kilometers or 25 miles from Vöcklebruck. That is when they came across a large object wrapped in tarpaulin. Or so they thought. The object, it turned out, was the half-naked body of a girl. That body was Martina. One of the divers said that Martina practically fell into his arms as she was sunk in the shallowest part of the lake. Upon examining her remains, it was revealed that she had been temporarily kept in a cool location before being thrown into the lake. The autopsy also revealed traces of seeds and grain, which had authorities thinking that perhaps she had been kept in a barn. The autopsy further revealed that Martina had been strangled no later than two hours after leaving home. And more specifically, she had not been strangled with the perpetrator's bare hands, but rather by what they assume was his arm being pushed into her neck. Further to this, her body showed injuries to the head, arms and legs. The following investigation also concluded that a few items of Martina's had been missing at the time of her discovery. Her black boots, her denim jacket, as well as her small handbag. The items are still missing to this day. Authorities did, however, closely investigate the tarpaulin Martina was wrapped in when she was found. And this was a very specific, imperfectly manufactured tarpaulin. More specifically, it was being produced in a factory in Lenzing, some 10 minutes from Vöcklebruck. Whatever imperfect tarpaulin had been produced would be sold to the company's own staff at a reduced price. So police of course questioned every single employee and even issued samples to shops and banks in the area, lest someone should recognize it. But again, without success. Authorities also never found out where her body had been stored prior to being discarded, despite her case being aired on Aktenzeichen XY, a crime show, and them collecting 500 alibis. Over the years and decades that followed, a sweater that had been seized from Martina's lifeless body and the two pieces of tarpaulin in which she had been wrapped disappeared. The sweater had last been with the team at Aktenzeichen XY. 
Investigations into the whereabouts of these items were unsuccessful. The Regional Court of Wales also complained that even after repeated requests, it had never received the complete files, records, and evidence on the murder case. At that time, no DNA traces were secured either, as the standard procedure in current murder cases. The attempt to subsequently secure the DNA on the evidence that was still present was unsuccessful for a long time. This turned out to be a particular setback, since after more than 25 years and without a DNA comparison, it was almost impossible to convict a suspect, especially if they refused to confess. Eventually, on February 9, 2013, 27 years later, Austrian newspapers finally reported that authorities had succeeded in isolating traces of DNA from Martina's fingernails, and investigators are certain that that DNA came from the perpetrator. This find also eliminated 10 suspects authorities had had in mind. Journalist and author Norbert Bleichinge, who wrote a book on the case, speculated that Martina had met with the stranger so that he would drop her to work again. But this morning, he had decided to try his luck with her, and when she rejected his advances, he strangled her instead. And this would make sense because had he been driving while strangling her, he would have only been able to strangle her with one arm being pushed into her neck, as the autopsy revealed. Manfred Schmidbauer, who was the lead investigator at the time and solved 179 cases successfully, said that some theories, as mentioned in the book by Norbert, are more likely than others. Still, he says it's important to keep an open mind and remain objective. He also hopes that books on the case will rattle the perpetrator and that they will realize police are not letting this one go. So who were the suspects? One suspect went by the name of Konrad K. Konrad is from Leondig, also in Upper Austria, and he was convicted in 1991 for assaulting four girls. Around 20 minutes after Martina's murder, Konrad was in Lakechen, just 12 kilometers or 8 miles from Monse. The investigators questioned him several times about the case, but Konrad denies killing her to this day. Another suspect was Wolfgang Ott, who murdered two women near lakes in Steiermark. He was arrested in 1995 near the Attersee in Upper Austria, but he also denied the crime. Leading forensic technician Friederike Blümelhuber said she does not believe that it was him. The third suspect is one of the most disgusting specimens of humanity to have ever lived, Josef Fritzl. At the time of the crime, Fritzl and his wife ran the Zum Seestern guesthouse opposite Martina's discovery site. Martina is also said to have looked very similar to his daughter, according to a news outlet. In July of this year, authorities have also disclosed that they are now looking into a further suspect, someone who is refusing to hand over their DNA. So far, there have been no updates regarding this individual, and no name has been disclosed. I believe that the overall theory is that whoever was in the car with Martina for a year straight, is very likely the perpetrator. If he was indeed innocent, why would he not have come forward and helped with the investigation? Original lead investigator Manfred was asked by a reporter what most haunts him about this case. And he said, The fact that I am certain I have already spoken with the perpetrator. And with that, I am finishing today's video. I hope you have enjoyed tuning in and hope to catch you next week with another one. See ya, Gators!